So, I mean, uh, do you guys know anything about Islam or are you religious yourself at all? Or? No. Not much. I mean, I know, you know, a little of Islam, but not much more than I would know about any other religion sure. other than Christianity, which is sure. where we're from. Everyone's raised sure. Christian, you know? Sure. So, yeah. Well, in Islam, I mean, we believe in all of the prophets from Adam, mm -hmm. including Moses, Jesus. Moses is mentioned, I think, I believe, 86 times in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Jesus is mentioned by name 25 times in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Muhammad, actually by name, is only mentioned five times in the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, many references to Muhammad, but uh, by name five times. Uh, there's a chapter in the Quran called Surah Maryam, Mary, and it goes through the virgin birth of Mary. But we see the creation of Jesus no different from that when God created Adam. So Adam was created from neither mother nor father, and we attribute no divinity to Adam. Similarly, Allah says in the Quran, it is beyond the majesty of your Lord to beget a child. So in the Quran makes it very clear that Allah says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad, he begetteth not, nor is he begotten. And there is nothing comparable to the Creator. Uh, and so in many in many ways, if you look at the second commandment, thou shalt not cast images, statues, engravings, you know, Islam operates as exactly the same principle. That there is no image of God, there is no likeness of God. That's the main difference, really. But Christianity, if you look at the words of Jesus, kindness, generosity, forgiveness, we find that consistent within Islam as well. Unfortunately, we have a problem though today, which is we have a friend of mine is a psychotherapist and I couldn't understand why do some people read the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and then go and kill people and they justify it saying my, my book lets me do that and it, it always bothered me I couldn't understand so I asked him and he's, a, he's a scholar as well and a psychotherapist and I said why do people do what they do why do they believe what they believe even when the vast majority of us clearly don't see the text in that way you know and he said well it's a, it's a psychological condition because you've got concept driven people and you've got data driven people the data driven are fairly open-minded they wait for the data they make their judgment and then you've got the concept driven and you find them in religion and out of religion as well and in all religions and in no religion so they already have a, a predisposition they have a hunch they have a feeling maybe it's more than that they have a, a firm uh, you know a firm uh, conclusion within their heart about a particular matter and then they only then select things even if they are out of context or they're not truthful to simply reinforce and feed those predispositions and that to me made a lot of sense and so things like for example suicide bombing when we look at the study in University of Chicago I think it was uh, Professor Robert Pate he investigates every suicide bombing from 1980 to 2003 and he finds that in virtually every case it was geopolitical yet they might may well have used religion as a as a, as a escape or a you know get out clause mm -hmm. or to validate what they did but it was always geopolitical geopolitical and so I think often what happens is the media have a certain image and I think there's a reality and sometimes the two don't marry they can be chalk and cheese they can be very different so that's what we really do here and I suppose the main reason is that in the Quran there's a chapter a very small chapter which says Bismillah Rahman Rahim I start with the name of Allah the beneficent and merciful Wal Asr Allah says I swear by time Inna linsan lafi khusr Mankind, humankind is at loss unless and then it lists four things Inna linsan lafi khusr Illa alladheena amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr Unless you worship the Lord, you do good deeds, and you encourage others to do the same, and you have sabr, you have patience. So you are at loss unless you do these things. So I suppose this is one way, hopefully, of, 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 uh, uh, of not being a loser.
<laughs> on the Day of Judgment, you know? <laughs> and trying to hopefully do right. what Allah has instructed us to do in the Quran. Right. So Allah says, you know, I swear by time that you are at loss. <laughs> Only if you do these four, then you are not at loss. Right. So it's that attempt to just really do your best. Were and you born into Islam as a, as a my, my, my parents were, My parents were Muslim, oh, okay. but uh, I would say at the age of about 15 or 16, that rebellious age right. of being told, look, you can't drink alcohol, son, you know, don't go out with girls, you can't do that, you can't, mustn't go clubbing because that'll attract wrong attention. I sort of asked the question because I was always a why, 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 why sort of boy, you know, and very rebellious. And I thought, well, look, I'm not wasting my time with this if I can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And of course, that reasonable doubt for different people, maybe at a different level, it's somewhat subjective, right? But I've got to be convinced. So there's got to be certain things about this religion Islam that I was born into that have to be there for me to want to effectively sacrifice what looks like a lot of fun, right? I mean, come on, my friends are out there drinking, they're clubbing, they're having a good time. So I, for my own rationale, my own reasoning, I said, well, this book that we claim is the Quran, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there has to be some proof and it has to be more than just fairy tales and you know your dad told you so or your uncle told you so or everyone's going to think very badly of you if you don't believe it. There's got to be more than that and of course if there isn't then nobody's going to know what I do secretly, right? If there isn't this God, there isn't this book, I can do what I want. I can go home be a, as a Muslim and outside I can be a non-Muslim, right? So I suppose that started my interest, my journey. And I thought, number one, the book has to claim that it is from God. Because if it doesn't, how do I know it is? You know, so Alhamdulillah, it does. It claims that it is, this, this is set down by Allah as a mercy to, to humankind, as a guidance, Allah says. I said, all right, next God, next stage. If it's by God, it has to be perfect. You can't make mistakes. Because if you tell me God created the universe and he did all of these wonderful things, like he can write a book <laughs> without errors, without mistakes, right? So, so I looked into, you know, what are the claims that the Quran makes? So Allah says in the Quran, and Allah applies the falsification test, like in what we have in science. So Allah says, this is from Allah. If it was not from Allah, then you would find this in it. You would find that in it. It, it actually gives you suggestions to look for these things for yourself to disprove it if it's not from God. So Allah says, had this book not been revealed by your Lord, you would have found much discrepancy in it. And then Allah poses the question. Allah says, that if you claim it's not from Allah, then come up with a reason for yourself as to where it's come from. So now it makes prophecies, it touches on things of nature that Muhammad was never exposed to, peace be upon him, which some, some of which was only proven many, many, many centuries later. So it touches on many things like, so for example, one of the verses of the Quran, do the disbelievers not know that the earth and the heavens were one? Then we parted them and we created every living thing from water. Will they then not believe? That an amazing statement for a 7th century Arab who was known to be illiterate, only known for his honesty, good nature and herding goats. And he's talking about the universe. He's talking about how Allah says, explains in the universe and it is we who are expanding it, referring to the universe. A 7th century Arab, illiterate, referring to the expansion of the universe. Many other things of that nature. But of course it mustn't make mistakes. So if the universe is not expanding and God says we are expanding it, then there's clearly an error there. So I was very interested in a book also that I found, which is written by a French surgeon, Maurice Bukai. And he wrote a book after he witnessed the mummy of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh uh, of the time of Moses. So he was invited to investigate this body and he was alarmed at the preservation of the body because of course we all know that Pharaoh drowned, right? Or so, so was the story, right? And drown, a drowning body within just a few hours in the heat and in the water, it will start to decay and decompose. 
So he says to his colleague, I'm shocked as to how well the body has been preserved. So the colleague says, don't mention this to the Muslims. He says, why? Because, because in the Quran, Allah says, we will preserve his body as a warning to the people in the future, the people that will come. So he said, the Quran makes this claim? How can the Quran make this claim? Anyway, so he, he, he gathers his interest. Anyway, he ends up writing a book. He ends up learning, a Frenchman ends up learning Arabic first. He wants to translate the Quran for himself. He writes a book in French, Le Bible, Le Quran et la Science. Translated into many languages, but in English, the Bible, the Quran and science. And he compares the Quran, he compares what the Bible says about things of nature. And he only compares those things which are now analytically and empirically sound. So not theories. And he finds a consistency throughout the Quran and he accepts Islam, he becomes a Muslim. Which was that this is the truth. But then of course I did have dilemmas, which were, well if it is the truth, why do I see so many Muslims behaving so badly? You know, you got this message that you claim is from God, and then you do this and you do that. Surely that, where do they get that from? And that's where I think the further journey of understanding maybe the psychology of people, that there's something inherent within us as human beings that will make us stray. And so one of the things that we have to read, even before we read the Quran, is a very small verse, which is, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, which is, O oh Lord, I seek refuge from Satan the outcast. So even before we read the Quran, we have to ask for protection from Allah that we're not misguided because of what we're reading. So it's not something that we look to feed our own misguidedness or our own aspirations, but that we do it with an open heart to actually absolve, uh, you know, absorb what the message actually is. So we're recommended when you don't understand a verse, go to a scholar, somebody who does understand. And then there are certain traits that you should look for in a scholar. So you're not misguided by somebody who says they're a scholar. So in other words, within the academia of scholarship, they all recognize this individual to be scholarly. So if they're fairly unified globally, they say actually yes, this guy, he is a scholar according to our view. It's safe to follow this guy to get his interpretation of what is actually meant. Mm -hmm. What you find actually, and I was uh, actually listened to a lecture by an American, uh, a white American guy named Hamza Yusuf, who converted it in the 70s. Very intellectual and had this very close link with scholarship um, to learn his own religion. Far more articulate than most people that I've met and an inspiration for me, despite coming to, the, coming to Islam after me because I was born into the religion, right? And he said exactly the same thing and he said, a lot of these guys that go and do these evil acts and the people that they quote are unanimously agreed by scholarship circles that they're not scholars. <laughs> and so that's where the danger is, you see? And so to a vacuum, you can fill anything. It just sucks it in, a sponge. So some of the guys they found going off to Syria and what have you, in their rucksack, they found the books like Islam for Dummies. So it just reinforces that whole thing that, you know, if you don't have knowledge, go to people that do have knowledge, but then you have to use your own intellect and your own understanding as well. You know, that doesn't mean that you just follow blindly, but if you're not sure about something, you ask questions, you know? Yeah. So that, that was sort of my journey, but then everyone else seems to have their own journey, you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. We do it, was, go, it was very nice speaking to you guys. You know, and um, we've got videos on, on YouTube anyway under EF Dawa. That's EF D A W A H Dawa. Uh, check us out and then, you know, hopefully you leave some posit positive comments. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Nice meeting you. Have a lovely holiday. Yeah?